Thank you, Sirx. Appreciate that warm welcome. Well, good morning, Gateway. Great to have you in church today. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I want to begin by reading from God's Holy Word today. Uh, so would you turn with me to the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. As you look for that particular book, uh, let me remind you that this book is written by Luke, and he has been recording the ministry of the early church. And we're going to read into a particular situation that we believe is relevant and applicable for us here today uh, as a church at Gateway. So let me read Acts chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Hey, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to worship you, the all-powerful and almighty God that you are. Thank you for your love, for your grace seen and extended to us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who teaches us and guides us. Thank you for your written word that is still alive and relevant and powerful to this very day. Father, we thank you for those things. And God, we pray that as we spend time in your word, and as I share some thoughts that I believe you place upon my heart, God, I pray that you would encourage us to be a people with purpose. Father, help me be with us all as we spend time in your word. And I ask these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, as you guys know, um, we are in the middle of our vision sermon series called uh, Expect More. And as Sirx mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, um, we are talking about more people with more purpose. You know, if we were to cast our mind back to the 1920s when Edwin Keith rode his, uh, his horse, I think it was, down Logan Road. I was going to say a bike, but I don't really know about that. I wasn't there hanging out at Logan Road in the 1920s. Um, but when he was riding that horse, beginning the ministry, since then, we have seen the faithfulness of God upon this church uh, in a number of different ways. You know, he has been both gracious and generous to this church in good times and also bad for an extended period of time. You know, we have seen and witnessed growth in our ministry to kids and youth. We have seen and witnessed growth in our ministry uh, to the community. We have seen growth in the number of people who have put their hand up and said, yes, here I am, Lord, send me, and have gone to various parts of the world as part of our Gateway Beyond team. And although we can look back over 90 years and give God thanks for His generosity and His grace, we believe that God's word for us this season is simply this, is to expect more. Expect more. And I don't know about you, but that, that kind of excites me. You know, if God's favor, blessing, guidance has been upon us for the last 90 years and, and His word to us now is expect more, man, we need to buckle up and get ready. We need to get ourselves primed up and in good position to expect more power through more prayer and also more people with more purpose. And this morning, I've drawn not the short straw, but the long one, where I get to talk about this idea of purpose because I love purpose. I wake up every day with purpose. I live for my purpose. My purpose floats my boat. I don't even have a boat, so I don't know why I said that. But I really love the idea of purpose. 
You know, we speak a lot about purpose here at Gateway. You know, be bold, step out, be courageous, find God's call and gift upon your life, the appropriate place to use that, and then get stuck into it. And the reason is we believe in purpose. You know, we believe that God, since the beginning of time, has set apart our lives and our future for a purpose. And we believe that when we discover and fulfill our purpose, it blesses God, it blesses the church to which we belong, and it blesses those that we live, work, and laugh with. And this morning, I get to talk about more people with more purpose. You know, I really love serving God through the church and into the community. And as I was preparing this message, I was reflecting on a bunch of, you know, uh, times that I've had as I've been working for or serving uh, Jesus and his church. You know, there have been youth camps where by the grace of God, he used a skinny kid from New Zealand, you know, to be a blessing to those who were there. Uh, There were other times when, you know, pastoral care was provided, you know, in certain ministry environments and during times of significant grief. But, you know, there was a time where I went to a youth camp. I was leading this camp uh, up on the Sunshine Coast. And, uh, and it, was a, it was a great camp. We got about two or three days into this camp. And then uh, the leaders and I had prayed and we decided that on the second last night of camp, it was a youth camp, by the way, that we were going to call the youth to fast. So we decided that we weren't going to serve meals the second last night of camp, and that the youth were going to love it, that they were going to use it as an opportunity to pray and to connect with God as they fasted from the meal that night. It was a great idea. It was a wonderful plan. I believed it was of God. However, within minutes of this announcement, we had kids shooting for the exits. We had mobile phones coming out of bags. We had kids ringing home. We had parents ringing me up going, what the heck are you doing? I heard you're not feeding my kid tonight. What is your plan? What is your thinking? Now, it probably wasn't a great idea, but I must say it was definitely a memorable time during my, uh, during my experience as someone who was living out their God-given purpose. I've got a couple of more stories that I'll share uh, throughout this morning. But you know, I have been a pastor for nearly 15 years, and one of the most frequently asked questions is around this idea of purpose, calling, service, ministry, giftings. What is God's plan for my life? Where do I fit into the scheme of things? What are my spiritual gifts? Why is there no opportunity for me to take advantage of and therefore serve uh, either in the church or in the community? And they are all good questions. They are all questions that are evidence of an indwelling Holy Spirit and a heart that wants to serve God and those that they live, work, and laugh with. You know, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, uh, the Apostle Paul, he says this, He goes, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And as I've already mentioned this morning, I don't want to become repetitive, but since the beginning of time, God has set us apart. He has put in place a plan for our lives, and that is to do good works. It is to do good service, good ministry uh, to those around us. Generally speaking, that is our purpose, is to do good works. And generally, our works, our services, our ministry, our areas of gifting are directed toward one of three areas. Firstly, toward God. For example, worship. Secondly, toward the church. And then thirdly, toward the unchurched. So generally speaking, we have all been created to do good works, either toward God, the church, or the unchurched, but yet within that plan, we are still looking for our special place, our unique spot where we can discover our gifts, serve God, and experience all that we do when we are fulfilling God's purpose for our lives. But friends, that's not easy. And I'll go out on a limb and I'll say there are some people in this room today who are still processing this idea of purpose. 
and are still asking the questions, what, where, when, how? I'm praying that today God's going to give you a word that will be a next step for you toward your God-given purpose so that we can have more people with more purpose here at Gateway. Hey, in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, there's a couple of things going on, and I'll share some thoughts with you this morning. Uh, As you know, Luke records the ministry of the early church. A whole bunch of stuff's been happening. The Holy Spirit was poured out upon His disciples. The church was born. They became witnesses, beginning in Jerusalem, and then moving out toward Israel. Uh, People were bringing the sick to the apostles. They are the sent ones. They were healing. They were correcting. They were reporting. They were doing a whole bunch of stuff. But in Acts chapter 6, we find that our, that our friends, the apostles, are struggling to meet the needs of a growing church. The number of disciples was increasing. The apostles did not have the ability to do all that God had called them to do and to do all that was happening around them. So as Scripture tells us, they came up with this great plan. They'll choose seven who will assist with the distribution of food to both the Greek-speaking Jewish widows and the Hebrew-speaking Jewish widows, and then hopefully meet and service the needs that were existing in this growing church. But one thing I love about this story is the seven. You know, the seven men, they were committed to the purpose, or they were committed to the discovery of their purpose. That's one thing that is for sure. They were committed to the discovery of their purpose. Let me share with you a few thoughts on this idea of purpose, and then I'm going to pull something out of our reading for this morning that I believe is the next word for you. A few thoughts on the idea of purpose. Firstly, can I tell each and every one of you here this morning that your purpose has been authorized. Your purpose has been authorized. Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 says this, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. If you have received Christ by faith as your Lord and Savior, can I tell you, you have the authority to not only fulfill your purpose, but to actually go and do it. And and for whatever reasons, various obstacles, thoughts, feelings get in the way of us pursuing and going. And this morning, I would like you to know that your purpose has already been authorized and you can go. You know, recently uh, here at Gateway, we have seen a number of our young adults uh, respond to the call upon God's life or the call upon their life to go into our community, nation, and our world and to be a blessing to others. And just recently, uh, a young adult returned after 12 months abroad. I'm just going to get her up here very quickly to share a little bit about her response to that. Uh, Would you welcome Bronte Ellsmore uh, back to Gateway? Bronte, welcome. Great to have you home. Thank you. We have missed you. I know some more than others, but that doesn't mean we all love you in a different way. Um, But it is great to have you back with us. Um, For those of us here who may not know you uh, or where you have been and what you have been doing, how about you share that with our friends today? Where have you been and what have you been doing? Yeah, so for the past 12 months, I've been in uh, volunteering as an intern at Bloom Asia in both Cebu, the Philippines and Cambodia. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Now, as you know, we're talking about this, more people with more purpose, the authority to go. Man, what what led you to pack your bags and move away from your family, your home church, to a a country that, you know, is is a lot different to ours? What was going through your head and your heart to make you pack your bags? Yeah, so I'd been on a few short-term mission trips to Bloom in the past and just really grew a strong passion for the ministry over there and what God was doing and the people and... Yeah, so, and I had a few people mention to me a possibility of an internship, and so I kind of had that in the back of my mind, but I was still at school, so I, yeah, just kept thinking about it, but, um, and then it was actually at a youth camp, um, Jason talked about stepping out in courage, and it was after that that I really felt God calling me to go, and it was my time, and um, yeah, after a lot of prayer with uh, my group, I just felt it was right, and so I emailed them, and not long after that, I was on a plane to Asia. Yeah, so. <laughs> awesome. That's great. 
Hey, uh, tell us about a time um, in the last 12 months when you were at Bloom, uh, be it Cebu or Cambodia, where you really sensed God speaking to you uh, and, and using you and revealing stuff to you in a special way. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, I kind of doubted like how I would be able to help or bless the girls over there and I would just pray all the time like, God, just use me and reveal to me what you want me to do and I just, yeah, I felt that he was like calling me through my art and my skills in like creativity to bless the girls and bring beauty to their workspace and yeah, I just... That was, yeah, probably one of the main thing, times I heard God speaking to me. And also through, yeah, I, f I felt him speaking to me like um, using my past experiences and challenges to be able to relate to these girls and share my testimony with them. And yeah. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Now, packing your bags, moving over there, although it was good and you saw a lot of cool things and you used your gifts, you know, prior to that, there must have been for you some things to overcome. Um, I don't know what they may have been. I've given you a green light and a blank canvas to speak into that. Um, but were there things you needed to overcome so that you could respond to God's call upon your life to go? Yeah, well, definitely, as I just said, I was yeah, really doubtful of what I was going to be able to bring or if there was anything significant in a way that I could impact them. I wasn't really sure. Um, yeah, but just trusting that God had it all planned and that he knew um, how he was going to use me and just giving it to him and letting him um, use me in any way that he wanted to to bless these girls and bring them joy and also I think yeah definitely financial side as well that was a big thing to um, yeah that was a bit of a fear like not knowing if I would have enough to get through the year and but again trusting God that he would provide and he wanted me there so he was yeah gonna provide and yeah. great hey and finally was there anything during your time away uh, you know what did you discover about your God-given purpose and what that may look like for the next season in your life? Yeah, so just knowing, uh, like when I got there, just I realized that God was able to use any of the gifts that I had to serve. And I always had the passion and my heart was in the right place. It was just opening up and allowing God to use me and just, yeah, not, um, yeah, just allowing him to use me and trusting him. And yeah, it's, yeah, it's been awesome to be a part of a bigger team that's bringing healing and joy to these girls' lives. And I'm, yeah, excited to see how he uses me in the next chapter, however that is. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool, right, church? Yeah, that's awesome. Hey, um, Bronte, I'd love to pray for you. Uh, please join me as I pray for Bronte. Feel free to extend a hand as I commit my sister to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for Bronte. Father, thank you for the way that she has heard your voice and that she has responded to the call upon her life to go. Father, I pray that all the learnings that she experienced whilst overseas will begin to formulate uh, your purpose for this next season in her life. You know, continue to bless her, help her to settle back into things here in Australia, God, and I pray that she would sense your leading and guidance in her life more now than ever before. Bless her, I pray, and it's in the name of Jesus that I do. Amen. Hey, would you put your hands together for Bronte one more time? You've been authorized to go. And you know, as you begin the process of discerning your God given purpose, you know, whether it's through, uh, you know, a divine revelation on a spot, whether it's through prayer, through the reading of scripture, through being a part of the church and putting your hand up and simply saying yes, through the trend of circumstances, through the past experiences of your life, be it childhood, personal, painful, professional, in and through all of that, you know, God works, He speaks, He calls, and if you receive any of that, can I remind you this morning that you have the authority to go. You know, don't let the fear of uh, failure or self-doubt or perhaps being seen as a hypocrite prevent you from stepping out and going and doing the things that God's called you to do. Uh, you have been authorized to go. Another thought I want to share with you this morning uh, is this. Your purpose is not only authorized, but it will be accounted for. Your purpose will be accounted for. Let me read again from Matthew chapter 25. Uh, verse 23. This is from the parable of the talents. Jesus is uh, using an example of a manager who distributes items of value to various people, and then he's calling them to an account on how they use those items. And then upon the good use of these resources, Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant. 
You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, this here is kind of like that little spiritual kick in the pants that we may all need at one time or another. You know, generally speaking, God's call for us is to do good works, generally into three directions. If we are in Christ, we have the authority to go, but it's important that we begin our movement toward a purpose, even if there is uncertainty around that, because our discovery of purpose and our fulfillment of it is going to be reported on when we stand before God on that great day. He's going to ask us to give an account on how we use the resources and the abilities that He has given to us, His people. And church, can I tell you that as a pastor, I take this topic, this day, this event in the history of God's people very, very seriously, and I want to prepare us as a church this morning for that day when we are asked those questions by God, what did we do with what we were given? It's going to be a great day, but at the same time, a day to keep in the back of our minds. And as we pursue purpose, and for whatever reasons don't step into it, man, that, that worries me. It concerns me uh, as a pastor, and I want to prepare us for that day when we are asked that question. You know, Rick Warren from Saddleback Church, he says about discovering your purpose and the pursuit of it. He says, eliminate any competing distractions to the pursuit of God's purpose for your life. If you're serious about serving God, you're going to have to cut some things out of your life. It may be less television or it may be something else. But if you put in the important things in life, you're going to have to take something out that is of less importance. Friends, you've been authorized and one day your purpose will be accounted for. And understand how it is, you know, being a being a, uh, a husband and a father, you know, it, it, time is of the essence. Hobbies are great. They keep us healthy. They keep us on track. But there are a lot of things that we allow into our lives that can compete against the pursuit of discovering God's purpose in our lives or can get in the way of us actually taking action and stepping forward toward the discovery of God's purpose in our lives. And what Rick Warren from Saddleback is saying, he's saying, look at these things. If you're going to begin this pursuit, if you're going to take steps towards something, eliminate any competing distractions, be it time, television, whatever it might be, and make space so that you can begin the pursuit of God's purpose for your life. Not easy, I get that. It may require time, but I believe that through the process of pursuit, God reveals, God speaks, God confirms, God clarifies, He crystallizes things for us. But it's important that we begin moving toward it because one day we're going to have to give an account on what we have done with what we have. But you know what? The good thing about all of this is that God doesn't leave it on a negative, all right? He doesn't leave us thinking, oh my goodness, I don't want that spiritual kick in the pants. I better get working because I have to. No, 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 no. He spices up this calling a little bit more by talking about the rewards we get for ministry. You know, not only is your purpose already authorized, not only is your purpose going to be accounted for, but get a load of this church. This kind of excites me, all right? Here we go. Your purpose will be rewarded. Your purpose will be rewarded. Now, I don't mind putting on a, I don't mind looking good. Let me just say that, all right? I don't, I'm not saying that I look good today. This was a, a very quick, no, it wasn't. I planned this outfit from Monday, to be quite honest. But, uh, you know, I, I don't mind putting on a nice hat, a nice shirt, a nice pair of pants. I don't mind rocking the eye watch, which I like to do. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't mind, you know, hanging out at Roger David at Garden City from time to time. I don't mind those things. But can I tell you that although that's a terrible example of the point that I'm about to make, the rewards that we are going to receive as a result of faithfully carrying out God's purpose for our lives is going to be far greater than any of those things. Not only are we going to live in our Father's house, in a room that He is preparing for us, and let your mind wonder, 
about how that could look. Man, I'm picturing big screens, PS4s, surround sound, Foxtel, unlimited non-stop coverage of the NBA. Uh, it is NBA All-Star Weekend, my favorite time of the year. Just let your mind wonder about what our father's or the father's room for us is going to look like. All right, enjoy that one. Um, not only are we going to live in a place where all things are made new, but we are going to receive crowns. We're going to receive crowns. Man, I don't mind taking off my Mitchell and Ness snapback cap and putting on one of these crowns. Let me tell you about them uh, for a few minutes. Have a listen to this. There are five crowns that Scripture talks about as rewards for fulfilling our purpose and our ministry. Have a listen to this. Firstly, there is the incorruptible crown, and we read about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25 to 27. This is for those who have resisted temptation. They have been faithful in prayer, learning, and growing in the things of Jesus. Secondly, there is the crown of righteousness. We read about this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. This is for those who have been forward in their thinking. They have set their eyes and their minds not on earthly things, but instead on the things of above. Thirdly, there is the crown of rejoicing, which we read about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19 to 20. This is for those who are concerned about the lost. They are the missional minded, those who are active in our community, our nation, and our world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fourthly, there is the crown of glory. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. This is for those who cared for the flock and are building up the body of Christ. And fifth, there is the crown of life. We read about this in James chapter 1, verse 12, and Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. This is for those who have been faithful during extreme persecution and have hung on to Jesus even to the point of death. The crown of rejoicing. Man, there's some pretty cool crowns. And if you are in Christ Jesus, and if you've discovered your God-given purpose and where you fit in this unique plan, guess what, my friends? You're getting crowns. You're getting crowns. Don't worry about the snapbacks. The yacht. You're getting crowns. You may even get more than one crown. But don't be greedy. Just be happy with what you got. Crowns. We get to rock that look great, don't worry about messing your hair, we're getting crowns. Your ministry, your purpose is going to be rewarded. Let me cast your attention back to Acts 6, 1 to 7, as I begin to land this, guy, uh, this thing for you. There is something special about the seven in this story that I think is worth mentioning and us adopting this morning. You know, they were chosen to partner up with the apostles, uh, to wait on tables. And it seems clear to us that the disciples were committed to the discovery of their purpose. But we don't know what their purpose was. We have very little information about whether or not they received a God-given purpose for them specifically. We have very little information about their spiritual gifts. We don't have the results of the spiritual gifts test that they took in discipleship class. We don't have any information or any copies of any theological streams or units that they did at college or university. That, that there's nothing like that. We have no, well, we have very little information, should I say, about the seven. All we know is that they saw a need and they stepped into it even if it wasn't the perfect fit or the perfect scenario for them. We have very little information about them other than they were committed to discovering their purpose and they stepped in and they met a need regardless of having maybe a little experience, qualifications and direction. They saw a need and they actually stepped in. You know, friends, we can easily fall into the trap of overthinking of over-praying, of over-spiritualizing uh, the things that we believe God is saying to us uh, in our lives. We can easily fall into the trap of looking for the perfect fit and the perfect scenario, and as a result of that, 
we become paralyzed. A friend of mine described this during the week as the paralysis of analysis. And this approach to looking for the perfect fit, the perfect scenario for the great situation to land on our laps uh, is true. I believe it wholeheartedly. This is our approach to various things in life. You know, when we begin looking for a, uh, for a job or a career, especially university students who are coming out the other end, there's no looking or searching for a perfect opportunity that could lead to something much greater. They're after the perfect scenario of a high pain level in management. It's true, we see it all the time. It's also the same in our approach to buying, let's say, our first home. You know, we, we, we don't look for the perfect opportunity so that we can get into the market and not be hamstrung financially because of the mortgage and then look for something that we can do up, sell, and maybe get toward our dream home. We approach the perfect home straight off the bat. We're buying the dream home straight away. We want the good thing. We want the whole story, the full package right there and then. And sadly, it makes its way into the church. God has a call upon our lives. Yes, he gives us certain gifts that need to be used in specific places. Yes, he has authorized, he has called, he has, um, he has rewarded or will reward us. But, you know, before we take a step toward us, uh, toward that, we want the perfect fit, the perfect scenario, and we want it to fall on our laps. And until it does, we have the paralysis of analysis. I love what the seven do here. We have little information, but they saw a need and they just stepped in and filled it. And I believe that in the process, God's going to speak. He's going to open up doors. He's going to create opportunities. He's going to confirm things uh, and so on. You know, I remember the very first day that I believed God was calling me to ministry. I was at a youth camp, wasn't even a follower of Jesus at this time. I had to go and see the camp leader in his dorm because I was in trouble. No surprises there. Anyway, I went and saw him and we're having a chat after he gave me the spiritual godly rebuke using all these words to try and make it sound really nice, but I knew that he didn't like me. He then turned around and he said, Jace, you know what? You could easily do what I do. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? And he goes, you could easily be a representative of Jesus, lead youth camps like this, and encourage people to pursue him. I started looking around the room for like bags of marijuana or maybe some alcohol and stuff like that. Thought maybe he was a bit under the influence. But after thinking about it for a while, I must confess that sat with me. And from there, I began the process of exploring, trying, meeting needs, and I got to a point where I'm like, yep, I think God's calling me to work in administration and finance. <laughs> That's not what he did. I'm surprised the finance ladies didn't jump to their feet in opposition just then. But that's when he called me to be a preacher and a pastor. But the process of working that, that out over time, uh, you know, it, it required time. But can I tell you, I love serving Jesus. I love the pursuit of purpose. I love carrying out my God-given purpose. Hey, uh, there was a particular time in my life, I've called this time a wedding and a funeral. Uh, I was pastoring in a church not far from here, and um, you know, uh, once upon a time, this elderly lady started attending uh, our church. Anyway, she was there for a week or two, and I finally had the chance to sit down with her and have a chat and hear her story about her life and how she came to our church. And I discovered that, you know, a couple of years ago, she had lost her husband uh, to illness, and she had moved into this retirement home called Renaissance down at Victoria Point there. Um, and, uh, you know, she just felt it was time, you know, to really search and seek after the things of God. But I also found out that she, uh, as a result of moving into this retirement home, she met another guy who had a similar story. He lost his wife to illness. He had moved into the same retirement home. And in the Renaissance Retirement Center, they hooked up. How cool is that? Anyways, um, they were together and, you know, they were enjoying things. And then I got a call from her during the week and she asked to meet up. I went and met with her at a coffee shop at Victoria Point, And she began to tell me that her and her newfound love wanted to get married. 
But not only did they want to get married, she also asked if I would prepare the funeral as well. And then I proceeded to find out that her husband-to-be was actually very sick and he was dying. Anyway, uh, I prayed about this very quickly. I didn't want to send her home and say, yeah, I'll get back to you, check your emails. I prayed about this. I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be a representative of God's love, grace, and care in this situation. So I said yes. So I met with a couple. We planned the wedding. Didn't say anything about the funeral. Just planned the wedding, and, uh, and then we were ready to go. The very next day, this man was rushed to hospital. The location of the wedding was moved to where it was previously, to a bedside wedding at the PA hospital. So a couple of days later, you know, I went up to the PA hospital ready to facilitate this bedside wedding. And, uh, you know, I walked into the ward, into the particular room. There were four or five beds in that room. And the room was packed. There were doctors. There were nurses there. It was packed. And anyway, I walked over to the bedside, um, to the bed, and, you know, I gave, uh, gave Pauline a kiss, gave Frank a high five, whatever it is. He had, a, he had an oxygen mask on his face because he needed some help with his breathing. And I just welcomed everybody. I introduced myself. I don't know why, but I reminded them why we were here. I began to lead them through the process. They made a commitment to me, to God. They made a commitment to each other. They exchanged vows. They exchanged rings. It got to the point where I said, you may kiss the bride. Frank just rips off his oxygen mask, gets his missus, pulls her over, starts getting into or starts kissing her uh, there in the ward. People are clapping, cheering. Man, and I just kind of I, I broke down. And I just thought, what a moment, what a moment. A couple of days later, got the word that Frank had passed away. So a day or two after that, here I was standing at the uh, Southern Gardens crematorium and funeral place in Mount Cotton, helping this dear lady lay her new husband to rest. And it was a great opportunity to share God's love, God's plan for those who choose uh, to follow Jesus. Can I tell you, that's probably one of the most memorable times in my life as a child of God who is fulfilling God's purpose, you know, upon his life. You know, we've all been created for a purpose. We've all been saved for a purpose. We've all been called to a purpose. We've all been authorized to pursue and fulfill our purpose. And one day our purpose is going to be rewarded. But you know, I really feel this morning that there are some people in this room that are suffering with the paralysis of analysis. You know, God has already created an opportunity for you. It may not be the perfect fit. It may not be the perfect scenario, but He's opened up a door and that door has looked like this. Here it comes. I believe this is God's word to you this morning. The door has looked like this. You've already received a tap on the shoulder. A pastor, a ministry leader, a friend, a loved one has tapped you on the shoulder and has said to you, you know what? I think you'd be great at that. I think you'd do well there. I think you should move in that direction. You know, I believe there are some people here experiencing the paralysis of analysis and you've already received a tap on the shoulder. It's not the perfect fit. It's not the perfect scenario. But can we use the seven and our reading today as an example in this morning I want to invite those of you to step forward, receive prayer, and then step in. You know, the beauty of this passage is that after people stepped forward and said, yep, you know what? I ain't got the perfect story yet, the perfect picture, perfect scenario, but I'm in. They stepped forward and the apostles laid their hands on them and prayed for more faith, prayed for courage, prayed for power, and then released them to then step in to meeting the need. And can I tell you, church, when you move out of this church and through the foyer, it's going to be hard to miss a need. There are needs splattered everywhere. And this morning, I believe God's calling those of you whom He has tapped on the shoulder to step forward, to receive prayer, and then to step in. Hey, can I invite you to stand with me this morning? Uh, I'm going to pray. And you know what? If, if this is for you, if you're sensing God nudging your heart or speaking to you in any particular way about your purpose and you really want to step forward, receive prayer, and then step in, 
just as the musos and the worship team play, just make your way forward. Just make your way forward. Actually, let's just do that now. If you would love some of our pastoral team, our prayer team to lay hands on you and pray about your purpose for more faith and wisdom so that you can step in. You've had enough thinking, enough worrying. You're just going to take this sucker by the horns. Let me just get you to come forward right now. Just make your way forward. We'll pray for you and, uh, and then we will uh, conclude our time together. So let's sing together in a couple of minutes. How about I pray? Father, I just want to thank you for those who are feeling and sensing your call as they come this morning right now. God, I pray that you would just fill them with courage and faith. God, even though the picture may be unclear, not 100% certain, Father, I pray that you fill them with boldness, with courage, just, just a sense that they're going to meet a need. God, bless them as they come this morning. Father, we are calling for more people, for more purpose. And God, by your grace, would you call them to yourself right now? And it's in the name of Jesus that I pray.